Hi everybody and welcome to this online tutorial for No Pain. First of all, thanks very much for joining me to watch this. And secondly, thanks to everybody and all the team from um, Trust Me Ed for coming over to the UK, to Kent, to come and record this session. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Mike Stewart. Some of you might know me as No Pain Mike. Uh, I'm a physiotherapist and I think there are three parts to my job. First and foremost, after more than 20 years of being a physiotherapist, I'm still absolutely fascinated by the job that I do. I think when physiotherapy works well, it's such a rewarding job. Uh, when it doesn't work well, it can be one of the most frustrating jobs on the planet, I suspect. Um, a lot of the work that I do with patients is trying to help people make sense of their pain and the chaos that comes with living with pain. Uh, a lot of the slides that we're gonna talk about today are gonna to come directly from the work that I do with patients. So hopefully it's gonna be quite a, a practical session. We're gonna use some role play with a patient to take you through how I would do things with people and combine those with some of the theories that we're gonna talk about. Um, secondly, the work that I do uh, as an educator, uh, I train people with no pain. So uh, I'm very fortunate now to have been to 15 different countries with no pain. I've taught over 600 clinicians, doctors and nurses and physios and chiropractors and osteopaths and uh, to try and provide them with some practical understanding of what pain is, how to help their patients make sense of it and maybe how to develop their teaching skills, uh, something that often we don't, uh, we don't learn uh, when we go through our training. Uh, thirdly, uh, I research, particularly research within communication, how metaphors work, can we get better at understanding our own metaphors as healthcare professionals and those that our patients use as well. So we're going to look at some of those things. Um, so hopefully today I'm going to share some of the experiences that I've had in teaching clinicians and also in my experiences within practice. Uh, if I think about why did I set up No Pain as a course, I think this slide really uh, summarises uh, my frustration that I felt. When I first qualified as a physiotherapist, I was eternally frustrated. I kept getting told that I could cure people's problems, fix people's back pain and neck pain. And I become very disillusioned because I would see Mrs. Jones on a Monday and I would do something to Mrs. Jones, uh, the electrotherapy machine or manual therapy or whatever it was that I was trained to do would help for two or three days. And then Mrs. Jones would come back with the same problem. So I started to wonder whether I was part of people's problem or part of people's solution. And I think sadly, I think often unwittingly without meaning to, we become part of people's problem. We don't want to be, but we just end up that way based on their expectations and our training. Uh, so we can see here we've got this uh, not so merry-go-round, patients who get stuck in this loop of just going continuously around the problem. Um, and we can see from the figures at the top there from Lau and Pentjora, in America particularly and across the world, the more things that we throw at people with pain, the more uh, complex interventions, the worse the problem often becomes. People want more interventional care. Uh, pain really is an epidemic, a global epidemic. Uh, in the UK here, there are 15 million people who live with pain on a day-to-day -day basis. Brevik and colleagues found in Europe that 19% of European adults live with pain. And just under half of those people said that their care was poor to inadequate, which makes us wonder whether we're doing what it is that our patients want. Are we using and optimizing patient-centered care? A rather scary statistic from America in 2011, the Institute of Medicine report found that 100 million Americans live with pain on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a global epidemic that seems to be getting worse, not better despite our best efforts to uh, find the holy grail magic off button for pain. It doesn't seem to be working very well. So I'd like to try and make this uh, talk as interactive as I possibly can uh, down a camera lens. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to think about making a wish. I do this with people on courses all the time. I get you to start thinking about if you had one wish, I usually give people a post-it note, so if you take a post-it note out of the drawer and write down what your wish from this talk would be, what do you want to achieve? Uh, just to show you through some wishes that I've received over the years with various healthcare professionals, 
Here is a slide showing some of the, the themes that seem to emerge from when I've asked 600 healthcare professionals. And what I always find is quite interesting is, regardless of culture, whether you're working as a doctor in Singapore or as a physiotherapist in Saudi Arabia, there are definitely some themes that seem to emerge. Uh, and the, the main theme appears to be practical ways to empower people, uh, practical ways to connect with people, to, just, to try and build therapeutic rapport, to become a better teacher, to become a better communicator. I'm going to base the learning objectives that we're going to talk about today upon what all of these clinicians have told me that what it is that they want. So hopefully you're wanting similar things to what we see here on this particular slide. So with that in mind, the learning objectives that we're going to go through are these. I'd like to provide you with some practical ideas of how to try and help people in pain. And as we say, we're going to look throughout at some role play of how I would use these ideas with patients. Uh, we're going to explore some evidence-based understanding of patient-centered care. What is it the patients want? Not what is it that we think they need, but what do they want? What does the evidence show? Uh, we're also going to look at how to try and become a better teacher particularly looking at the dynamic relationship between challenge and support. How much do you challenge your patient? How much do you support them? That dynamic is going to change with every session and with every individual that you see. The researcher Bullington once said, to encounter another human is to encounter another world. Every time you meet another patient, it changes dramatically. There is no formula, there is no recipe to what we do. We're also going to look at metaphors. Metaphors, I do some research within metaphors, and we know that metaphors are quite powerful. Uh, they can help, but also they can hinder people's understanding of pain. Uh, we use metaphors a lot as clinicians. We're going to look at a couple of examples of, of those, but patients use metaphors a lot, and maybe we need to get a little bit better at understanding what to do when they express their chaotic experience through a metaphor. How do we help them? Because I think we can guide them towards behavioural change through their own metaphors. So we'll look at that. And we're also going to look at how do we try to apply pain science, particularly in the world of sport. I think sometimes we can fall into a trap of thinking that pain education is just for people who are in wheelchairs or with fibromyalgia. And actually, I think pain education is for everybody. Every problem, every pain problem has a thinking, reasoning, emotional brain attached to it, said Louis Gifford. And I think he's very right. It's, uh, we've got to look at everybody in pain, whether it's acute, subacute, chronic, not to pigeonhole things too much. Okay, so first of all, a good place to begin is a definition. And I think if we look at these two definitions here from Mountcastle and from Lorimer Mosley, not a million years have passed between these two definitions. So 1980 from Mountcastle, 2003 from Lorimer Mosley. Not a huge space of time in between these two definitions, but a huge shift in thinking. And I often get people on courses to start trying to tell me any words that are interesting within Lorimer's definition that highlight that change in our thinking. And I think there are a few things that people often come up with. First of all, a multiple system. Pain is not coming from one place. There is not the, the holy grail magic off switch for pain. Secondly, output. Lots of people still understand pain as an input. If it hurts in your ankle, it's coming from your ankle. That's certainly the way I was trained. If somebody comes in to see me with knee pain, I will do something to their knee. So I think we've got to start thinking about pain as an input. Uh, and as an output and being able to try and shift patients understandings away from all about the tissues and maybe shift our understanding so, uh, so as we're not thinking that it's all about the brain it has to be about the two combined um, so I think output is an interesting word to look at but I think the most important thing and you can see here from Laura Mosley's definition is perceived threat that's why we have this very scary looking saber-toothed tiger on this image Pain is a perceived threat. Uh, it's, pain is directly linked to how confident you feel, how vulnerable you feel, how fragile you feel. And we know as healthcare professionals that quite sadly we can make people feel more fragile, more vulnerable through nocebo uh, information. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't au fait with nocebo, I often describe to patients, people often understand the term placebo. Nocebo is placebo's evil twin. It's threat information, things that people are looking for to attend to their, uh, to their belief systems. And often that can be not very helpful. So um, 
in terms of threat and delivering threat for patients, there are a number of ways that we can do that as clinicians. This is the biggest way. I think this is a threat machine. Our mouth, the things that we use, the things we say, are extremely threatening for patients. I'll give you an example. I had a gentleman in my clinic a while ago, and in my first session we were going through our questions, and I did my standard question about uh, corda equina. Any problems with your bladder or bowels, I said. And he stopped and looked horrified. He said, you do think I have, bla you think I have bladder cancer, don't you? You think I've got bowel problems and bladder problems. That's why you're asking that question. Why did he think this? Because his father had died of cancer the year before. So sometimes we can say things, we can uh, use words that aren't threatening at all to us, but are highly threatening to the person who we're seeing. Pain is a gig, like a music concert, where the devil plays all the best tunes. People are looking for threat information to support their beliefs, and we have to be very aware of that as physiotherapists. Professor Brian Hurwitz also said something else about pain, which is quite interesting. He said, pain not only hurts and demands relief, it also scares, baffles, enrages, isolates, and it resists treatment and demands interpretation. When you have pain, you're desperate to know why. Why is this hurting? Why hasn't it gone away? It can become eternally frustrating to have pain and for it to not go. So we have to be aware of how to help people understand this. But I think these two definitions show that shift in our thinking in a very short space of time. And maybe uh, the general public and the media and lots of patients, lots of clinicians too, are still playing catch up with how to try and think about pain, to change their understanding. So one of the first things that I tend to do, if I'm starting to help people make sense of pain, uh, I'm sure most of us have seen this movie, Sixth Sense. Uh, the little kid in this movie can see dead people. Uh, we see lots of people with pain and our job is to try and help them make sense of what's going on. One of the things that I often do uh, is to start using different sensors. So in a strange way, to help people make sense of pain, maybe we have to move away from talking about pain. Maybe we need to start talking about other things, other perceptual experiences. Uh, if pain is a perception, maybe it's time to help people make sense of taste perception, hearing perception. Uh, so on the courses that I teach, uh, we ha often have taste experiments, uh, we often do hearing experiments, a variety of engaging ideas to get people to go, ah, oh, okay, I understand. I often think that, that helping people make sense of pain is a little bit like having a whole range of fish hooks. Some of those fish hooks are little pink ones, some are big black ones, some have got fluff on and fur and all sorts of different things. You need this whole range of fish hooks to be able to catch as many people's attention as possible. Our job as therapists is to dangle those hooks out there and put as many out as possible and see what's going to work for each individual person. So a whole variety of practical things that we're going to take you through. So uh, there's a reason that we're going to look at uh, using different sensors like hearing and taste today. The psychologist Fordyce once said something quite interesting. Let's see if you can work out what he means. He said, for behavioural change to take place, information alone is like throwing spaghetti at a brick. Bit of a strange concept. But if we think about this for a minute, if you're trying to change somebody's behaviour, then if we just provide information, i.e. we just talk at our patients, the, you know, I, I see this a lot in clinic where the patient says, I don't understand why I'm in pain, and the clinician then embarks on a 10 minute monologue, which is very evidence-based and beautiful and great, but the patient is quiet, they're passive, they're nodding away, and we're assuming that we've got the fish hook in the mouth. We think, oh, okay, they, they seem to be understanding what it is that I'm teaching them. But actually what then happens? They come back the following week and everything's the same. Their behavior hasn't changed, they haven't returned back to sports, or they haven't become more confident with bending to pick their baby up. So what Fordyce is saying is if we just provide information, if we just talk to people, if we just show them data and information, that's not enough. What we have to do is provide experience. Experience enables us to stick the spaghetti to the brick. If we throw spaghetti at this wall behind me and it stays there for uh, maybe 10 minutes, that's not enough. We need it to stay there longer. Experience enables us to stick that spaghetti to the brick to provide something more concrete, more permanent. So I'm gonna show you how I would help a patient understand pain by talking about hearing. 
So let's look at a short role play uh, where I can do that and teach you how to use this with patients.